Okay. Okay, so let's have the class and uh, we will finish about these. Then we go for the first lecture of what. Now, this is what uh, we talk about. It is called uh, chemosmosis, which is how they generate the protein molecule force. Chemosmosis. Okay, they generate proton motive force. Okay, so what the story is that? This story is that this is a cell membrane system. And inside and out and outside. Now you had an NAD H becomes NAD plus then you have like a, here we have like a succinate ubiquino all these things okay. there is a simple structure here like a, a chemical, like a machinery here. now what happened is once this NADH oxidized a bit become, become NAD plus this hydrogen will be repelled outside of the cell membrane system and accumulates it. Of course, they need an enzyme, and this enzyme is dehydrogenase. Dehydrogenase. Of course, they need an enzyme. Now, this is accumulated more and more there, become a potential energy. And when they are, potential energy later on will become a kinetic energy to be used. When they accumulated so long, what's going to happen? They actually will be moved back. And they flow back. Okay, they lose all the flow back. Now once they flow back, what are they going to do? They will be triggered ADP becomes ATP. And they activate these proton, which is activate ATP synthesis, synthesis, and they generate ATP. And this process, which is coupled with the electron transfer during the electron transport chain. So this is here is the electron transport chain. The electron is transfer, transfer, and with the help is dehydrogenase, the proton repel out of the cell membrane, accumulate there, become a potential energy. That is called proton motive force. And once they accumulate more, they're going to come back. And they activate ATP synthesis, they generate ATP. Now, specifically for bacteria cell, what are going to happen? It will be also coupled with. Polygena rotation. Because at the end of the day, the energy you have to be used. To. And this whole story is called the chemosmosis. How they generate protein motive force. Okay. Chemosmosis. Chemosmosis. It's Peter Miniature. Mitchell, I believe is the 1960s, he created this. It's a Nobel Prize. Okay, so you can see right here, that's what happened. And once, uh, here I also want to mention this proton go back to the cell membrane. This is actually, he is active, the active transportation. That's the story about proton multiple force and chemosmosis. Now, this is what we already mentioned about. Uh, we're using uh, glucose going through complete aerobic respiration. How many ATP they going to generate? And I said it's going to be your homework, so we will do. Let you practice the calculation. 
Okay, but this is some of the conclusion here. You can see so how many generate from a substrate level level phosphorylation, how many generate through, through oxidative phosphorylation, and the total ATP is 38. And remember, this is the old rule, not the new rule. The new rule probably about 34. And this is the calculation I already did the last time. So you can see the slides and then you finish your homework. Now we want to briefly mention the fermentation here. Okay. Uh, we will spend the time to talk about later on in this section. So fermentation. So first of all, what is the definition of the fermentation? Lots of the people will talk about that. Fermentation is electron donor is organic chemical. And the electron acceptor is also organic chemical. Now basically there is two types of the fermentation gonna happen. Number one, we call it hormone fermentation, which is pyruvate will become lactic acid. And this is coupled with NAD, oxidized become NAD plus. So pyruvate, which is reduced become lactic acid. The second, which is we call it a hetero. What is the hetero form? Which is the pyruvate. At the end of, it will become alcohol. That is why the wine will have alcohol generated. But don't forget, there is an intermediate product that's, which is right here, acetaldehyde. L B five and then become alcohol. So that's called hetero fermentation. Now both of these is happened in the absence of oxygen. And only two ATPs generate through substrate level phosphorylation and without electron transport chain. Okay? Now, very important here, you will see, this regenerates NAD plus, we should have a blood container, an empty container can be accepted a new electron. That means the electron carrier is recycled. So here, will be coupled with glycolysis. That is where this happens. That is where these two ATPs generate. Okay? Now, this is what we're going to mention. The fermentation will generate lots of products. And it will generate lots of chemicals like ethanol, biotoric acid, probiotic acids. Remember that a bitoric acid and a probiotic acid, these are short chain fatty acids, actually very short chain fatty acids. We will mention real quick. Now, what the products will happen for the fermentation? Lactic acid, you know that when you have a cheese, sour cream, all those have lactic acid. Ethanol. We use a bacteria, which is a beer brewing, we call it so Saccharomyces. We will generate alcohol, ethanol, and carbon dioxide. That's used for beer and wine. And we have acetone. Acetone, this is actually re related to the uh, nail remover. If the ladies they use it, some of the cosmetics, they want to remove it, they buy an acetone. That acetone coming from is bitory gases originally from fermentation of crosstree. Okay, that's acid. Now, some of the products, like say, let's say Swiss cheese, 
you will see it tastes very acid because probiotic acids. And you see those holes there, that's carbon dioxide. And then you will have some mixed products. For example, acidic acid we're going to generate. Where are they used for? Used for the vinegar process. Okay, so these are the things that gave me a conclusion of what type of the products the fermentation will be using. And in this later of this lecture, we will talk about later on this session, we will talk about the dairy products of these. Because in Pennsylvania, it's a very good market for dairy products in the same in the same central area. Okay, so that's why we want to mention that. Okay, this end up with this section when we talk about the overview of the biochemistry. And then today, we're going to move on to talk about our real uh, food chemistry section. We're going to talk about the water first. So this is the first slide we want to talk about water. Now, I will be closely stick to what we talk about for our lecture. The book, the textbook, the fifth edition which is IFT certified textbook. So you can read through that and some of the homework will relate to that. And I studied myself and I also take lots of notes. So I'm gonna talk about this one by one, okay? So first of all, we're gonna talk about the water. The first slide uh, is very easy. This is some example of the water, why it is important for the food application. And then we will go into very briefly. It's a good dissolvent, so drinking water, bottle of water, use that the beverages, dissolve acid, become acid products, carbon dioxide used as the beverages, and we can make a tea, coffee, and the sports beverages. So these are the very common food application. Now here, during the food processing, you know the pot potatoes, tomatoes, and the team regarding the poultry processing, we talk about scaldering, chilling, and the rinsing. Regarding microbiology, that is very important because scaldering temperature has to be controlled. If it's too high, what is gonna happen? The fat will be accumulated during the chilling, then increase the cross-contamination of the bacteria. And the chilling temperature has to be lower, has to be make sure it's 4 degrees Celsius. And the rinsing, finally you use antimicrobials to rinsing. So that's a very typical use for water during the poultry processing. And the cranberries harvesting, those are using the food processing, post the harvest of food processing. Now, the water also can be heated or cool, or we remove it, we call it dehydration. And we also do a water extraction for different type of the proteins, including soil, whey, and the muscle proteins. So these are just the example of the food application. And it's very common knowledge, and then we just go over it. Okay, now we're gonna talk about something new. Uh, we not talk about that be before. First of all, there is basically two type of the water in the food system. Number one, we call it free water. What means free water? You can understand it is freezable, can do free breathing, can be used, used as a solvent, and it's moving also. So that's a free water. And how we know it is a free water? There is two things we can do. Number one, we can do a centrifuge. Okay, think about in your home, you have a closed washing machine. What is the last step in centrifuge? All the water is gone. You do a spin, high spin, then you, the water is spilled out. That is a free water, so you can do a centrifuge. The second way you can do, get the free water, is you use a filter paper. So let's say you have a chicken meat, you put on, a, uh, uh, put on a filter paper, you will see that the water there. That's is the free water, okay? Now this is easy to understand. The second way you need to know, there is some water in the food system, you can use it. That's called boundary water or boundary water. 
they are frozen even at minus 20 to minus 40 degrees Celsius. They are not motility. They cannot be moving, they cannot be used, unavailable for a for sovereigns cannot dissolve anything like salts. That's a boundary water. Now, boundary water usually it is talked about is a mono layer of a water. And we will explain to you later on what is mono layer. So that is called a boundary water. Now, I want to mention is that in our food products, they more or less has some boundary water. So I give you an example. If it's in lean meat, it is about 11.4% is boundary water. But how about fresh vegetables and the meat and the meat uh, and the uh, vegetables the produce? In the produce products, it is about six percent is boundary water. So more or less you have some, you cannot avoid it. Okay? So that's the first thing is talk about free water and the boundary water. But here we also want to mention, or although we call it boundary water, does not mean it's not useful. Both of them are available for I will say biochemical reaction. Not say they cannot do any of the reaction. They are available for any of the reaction. Okay. This is the first one. Second one. This is not in the textbook, but I want to mention because it's a very common knowledge, which is we're going to talk about soft water and the hard water. Okay. First of all, soft water. Number two is hard water. Okay, what is soft water? I can have an example. Our drinking water. And in the United States, you can say tap water. Because the EPA regulated the tap water is drinkable in the United States. Hot water, well water, and pound water. Okay, now what is the measurements to differentiate the hot water and the soft water? That is the concentration of calcium and the magnesium. Okay, now calcium and magnesium, these are the standards required by the EPA. Calcium 40 to 80, 40 to 80 ppm parts per million. Magnesium is 20 to 60 ppm. Oh, sorry, 20 to 30 ppm. Okay, that's upper and the lower limit. Now, hot water, because they existed, calcium and magnesium, so we try to remove it. Therefore, there's two types of the hot water. Number one is temporary. Temporary, usually, it is calcium or magnesium bicarbonate, okay, bicarbonate, and we can remove it. You know that we boil. It. And we're going to talk about the boring very quick. Okay. Second one is permanent. Permanent, we cannot remove it. The reason is the calcium and the magnesium, it is sulfite phosphate. Sulfite phosphate. So there's no way to remove it, use boring methods. Other chemical methods maybe we can remove it. So example, sulfate, calcium sulfate, 
magnesium sulfate, these cannot be removed by boring method. Okay, so this is just let you know the soft water and the hot water. Now, regarding the area, well, in my area, which is for the microbiology, some of the antimicrobials, when you prepare, you can't use hot water. You have to use soft water because the hardness may affect the ingredients of the antimicrobials. So be careful. Lots of the local growers in the West Virginia area, they don't really care. They're using like whale water to prepare those solutions. Sometimes we will lose the effect. Or pound of water. That's not good. You have to use a soft water, at least a tap water. Okay, so that's what something I want to mention. Okay, this is the properties of water. Uh, you know lots of them, but something I still want to mention because it's related to what we're going to talk later on. Property of the water, you know. Molecule of S18, molecule of volume 55.5. That's you know about these things. Boiling point 100 degrees Celsius. But this is which is the elevation is zero. Is the C elevation. You need to know. Freezing point is zero degrees Celsius, which means you don't have any purities here. Pure water. Now triple point surface tension vapor pressure we will talk about sometime. Uh, delta H, which means energy used for the vap uh, vaporization and the fusion. And then we talk about the heat capacity, viscosity, and density. Now always remember the density of the water is always 1G per cubic uh, centimeter. And we say ml. Okay? So water is actually very heavy. Now you need to know the density of the water, the maximum is at 4 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's something you need to know. Now we want to talk about some, something else. This I will mention here, we will mention again. Okay, let's say I have a bottle of water. This is what is right here. There is a water molecule here. It's a closed vessel. Okay, a closed bottle. And I want to tell you one thing, the water molecule in the solution, some of them will be released, go to the air, surrounded with this water, just up above the water. Some of them will be also go back, some of them will go out. Later on, we'll reach an equivalent. E equivalent. Uh, e equivalent. Okay. Now, once they reach an equivalent, what are going to happen? They will have some of the pressure on the top of this closed vessel. This is called the vapor pressure, which indicates a saturated status. Okay. Now, how do you know the vapor pressure is going to be higher or lower? Of course, number one, higher amount of water molecule. Number two is vigorous motility. Okay, so that's a vapor pressure. That's a pressure of the uh, of the these air, which is generated by water up above the water solution. Okay, then when you will reach the boring status, there is some pressure on the top. This is called atmosphere pressure. Once the atmosphere pressure equals vapor pressure, it is starting to happen the boring. Okay? 
At, in other words, if it's a higher atmosphere pressure, it is difficult to bore it. Then what you have to do? You have to heat it. So you have to do the heating. Therefore, if it's a higher atmosphere pressure in the mountain area, the boring temperature will be decreased. Uh, 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 oh, sorry. In the, in the mountain area, with the increasing of the elevator, the atmosphere pressure will be decreased. So the water boring temperature will be decreased. This is the reason, team, I ask you to check our water bus, can we reach 95? Because we are in the mountain, Ab Abalachi mountain area. Moderate, not really. But if it's good, we can reach 95 degrees Celsius. We used to be at Colorado State in, in the um, uh, Fort Collins, which is in a, a rocky mountain area. The boring temperature is usually about 93 or 92. So this gives us another point regarding the food safety. If you go a mountain area, if it's like 4,000 meters higher, you go have fun there in case. Let's say very top of the, of, of the Rocky Mountain. If you do a camp there, you're going to boil some of the foods. You have to boil much longer time because maybe 80 degrees Celsius is not boring. And the food will not be safe if you eat just boring at that temperature because the bacteria, some of them may not be here. Okay, so here there is a reason why increase the elevation, the boring temperature will be decreased because the atmosphere pressure is decreased. Once the vapor pressure and atmosphere pressure is equal, that's a time where what happens is boring. So, okay, so basic physics. This is a formula in our textbook used to calculate the boiling point elevation. Now in here, I just only introduce this equation to you. You know there's an equation. We're not going to spend a bunch of time to do the calculation because it's a chemistry. Okay. So here gives you an example. You see a delta T, V is the increasing boiling point of the solution. The calculation including the number of ions the boring point uh, con constant and the molecular concentration of the sodium. So based on this formula, and they do the calculation, if the solution containing 75 gram of sodium chloride, the volume is 500 ml, what the temperature needs to be reach the boring status is 102.76 degrees Celsius. In other words, if you are boring a sugar solution or salt solution, the temperature is much higher than boring